uh, to which he dies. Now, I keep moving because we get so much to cover in a short lecture, I'm making big jumps here around key points. So part three here, the New Deal in the 1970s, because of course the narrative until now has all been about, uh, in various aspects of Pennsylvania, about the Republican machine, Pennsylvania supporting abolition, and uh, the African American vote being solidly Republican, uh, and other incoming groups being Democratic, like the Irish. But this all reverses, starting in the 1930s. Of course, today, uh, the African American vote is synonymous with the Democratic Party, and I'll explain how that happens in due course here. I already have a little bit. Now, I give you a little bit here about the, the kind of pattern uh, of 1870 1935, this background. Uh, African American Pennsylvanians uh, tend to be Republican and they're competing with poor European migrants for manual jobs and they tend to come in and be factory workers, for example, they tend to be Democratic. Wealthy black Pennsylvanians are focused in Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. Remember Pennsylvania had this statistically insignificant black uh, population prior to the end of the Civil War. At the end of the Civil War, freed blacks flood north because they're afraid initially slavery will be reimposed in the south. They are then afraid of violence because of the Ku Klux Klan, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Freed blacks flood north, and when they go north, because the farmland's already taken, they end up in cities, principally Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. The rapid growth of Pittsburgh in this period, remember how I talked about the way in which it goes from a few thousand back in 1850 to you know, hundreds of thousands in 1900, uh, that in part is due to the influx of uh, African Americans to Pittsburgh. So again, if I kind of hang this part of the story off an individual, Daisy Lampkins, uh, uh, as good as any, uh, she's right, re remarkable in a whole variety of ways. There are other remarkable black Pennsylvanians, wrong, uh, but I, I have to sort of try and hang this story on somebody, so uh, I followed the lead of the Pennsylvania Heritage Journal and went to Daisy Lampkin. Uh, a variety of things she's remarkable for, she kind of exemplifies, because she dies in the, the height of the civil rights movement as, as it's told through the southern story of the 1950s and 60s, uh, and so, but yet she's alive, uh, born just after Cato dies, so she's a nice next chapter in the story here. And you can see all the advances that African Americans make in Pennsylvania in this period. Uh, the, the Negro Women's Equal Franchise Federation is uh, in part founded by Daisy Lampkin. She becomes chairwoman of the Allegheny County Negro Women's Republican League. Uh, like most African Americans, she's a, a Republican. Uh, vice, she becomes vice chairwoman of the Negro Voters League of Pennsylvania, vice chairwoman of the Colored Voters Division of the Republican National Committee. Uh, she meets President Kelvin Coolidge in 1924, among, uh, together with a group of other prominent uh, black rights leaders. I think she's the only woman of the group to meet the president. Uh, the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, do keep in mind you cannot use the phrase colored people at the moment. You have to say people of color. You will be subject to all kinds of abuse if you say that wrong way around, right? That's an incredibly sensitive point at the moment. But it doesn't change the fact that historically, and what's well, still the, na the name here, so I give you these as, as historical facts. Maybe I'm too worried. Uh, the NAACP is a National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. It's established uh, nationally in 1909, New York City. It's founded to combat Jim Crow and black codes in the South. Uh, do you all familiar with this phrase, Jim Crow? Uh, Jim Crow's a vaudeville character. Uh, it's a white person performing in blackface, doing silly and demeaning things, take, making fun of black people. So it's a really offensive term, but it becomes so popular that even in Britain, the, the skit show of Jim Crow is known, and Jim Crow becomes collectively and is now used, uh, it's a loaded term, but it's now used in even the most liberal of, of modern media by whites and blacks to describe the de facto system of segregation which exists in the South even after segregation is formally abandoned. So Jim Crow takes in the way in which in the South every single state had a slightly different version of what blacks could and could not do. So you have to have a collective turn to encompass that. Uh, first, that was uh, referred to as black codes, but then black codes were made illegal in the South, and so this 
broader term of Jim Crow is used. So there's a lot of baggage on that term I, I've got to convey here. Okay. Uh, Lamkem establishes the Pittsburgh chapter of NAACP in 1915. Uh, she becomes their first field secretary. And she's vice president and eventually editor of the Pittsburgh Courier, which if you recall, the Pittsburgh Courier is the most important black weekly magazine or newspaper published in America. Uh, Robert Vaughn, who is editor of the Black Courier, said in relation to the 1935 New Deal, campaigned on by governor, future governor George Early of Pennsylvania as the Little New Deal, Pennsylvania, he said, go home and turn Lincoln's picture to the wall. The debt has been paid in full, i.e., African Americans tend to be the poorest, most vulnerable in society. You should be backing this democratic plan to get, create more social welfare. Obviously, he was at odds with his event. He was at odds with uh, Lampkin, who succeeded him as editor. But Lampkin, of course, was a national chairwoman for the Republican Party. So you can see a, a battle for the the uh, souls of black voters here. Should they be a traditionalist Republican, or should they go for the new social welfare? Uh, policies in the New Deal. And uh, Lampkin and Van fell on opposite sides of that divide. What is the New Deal nationally? Well, the, the New Deal sets up a whole variety of federal programs. It's not just things in the state to help poor people. It also creates the uh, Social Security Act, which uh, puts in place what we know now as the state pension. It creates universal unemployment for those out of work. The Housing Acts of 1937, 49, 65, 68, 74 all create more and more and more uh, access to what we would think of as kind of council housing in Britain, housing for the poor, subsidies to top up rents so that private people will rent a flat, say, uh, to a poor family and then take some of the rent money from directly from the government. Uh, black populations, oh, we here, uh, Lyndon Johnson, of course, that's that sort of a chap who's a Democratic president, 1964, but we, as we also associate with these really racist remarks. He declares the quote, unquote, war on poverty in 64, and with the Food Stamp Act, he creates what in America still exists and are still called food stamps, which are sort of packets of coupons, a bit like ration books, sent to low earners so that they can spend in grocery stores to buy food at the government's expense. Uh, black populations are urban populations in Pennsylvania and the North in general. Never forget this. In 1940, one in eight Philadelphians are African American. By 1963, one in four Philadelphians are African American. Can you see how rapid this growth is? And uh, industrial production during World War II, World War One, and then again, and especially during World War II, act as magnets. Uh, for poor Southern African Americans who can't get a job in the South and are living in traditionally agrarian areas in the South. The reason so many more come during World War II than World War I is because by World War II, we have good infrastructure and railways linking the North and the South effectively, and it's easier and cheaper with buses and things for African Americans to migrate to the North, to Pennsylvania. Until 1964, the media, television, the radio, and so forth, focuses on white poverty. And indeed, London Johnson did a famous photo call where he sits in a porch of a poor white southern family shack surrounded by their 11 children, going, oh, I can't figure out why you're so poor. It's wrong. So I should keep my anti-southern stuff un under my cap, shouldn't I? Uh, but yeah, you'd get that if you knew a little bit about discourse about the South in America. White Southerners. Right. Uh, now, the Civil Rights Movement really is going from 55 in, in, in the South with Rosa Parks back with bus, challenging the Jim Crow laws, black codes in the South, and so forth. But it's really in the 60s when we see the first big riots in the North by African Americans in the North against the backdrop of the creation of a welfare state. Uh, the sort of second generation welfare state in the 60s with Lyndon Johnson, the uh, equality, the 1960s Equality Act, sort of top up, uh, which we'll come back to, and uh, a feeling of, of uh, suffering and social depredation in what are becoming ghettoized, rundown areas of inner city Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, New York, for example. 
So there are big riots in Philadelphia on 28 to 30 August 1964, the so-called Philadelphia Race Riots, and an overwhelmingly white police force uh, is sent in to break up the riots. Uh, I mean, there's been a film about the 1964 riots that happened in Detroit just in the last year, the, the Watts riots, isn't it? Anybody see that film? I, di I didn't get to see it. No. Right. Anyway, the Philadelphia Race Riots are very famous in Pennsylvania. There are some small isolated riots in Pittsburgh, but nothing to compare with Philly. Uh, in 1966, JFK is, is uh, killed. There's a kind of background here. And JFK was seen as a friend to the civil rights movement. So that, that continues to keep trouble burbling along, a, a sense of discontent. Uh, and between 1967 and 71, there are almost weekly small-scale riots in North Philadelphia, almost weekly. It's a terrible And this is the beginning of what we call white flight, which is to say middle-class whites fleeing inner city areas in large numbers, which cre increases the proportional uh, black part populace, leading to the intensification of, of uh, really a mono-ethnic intercities in, uh, uh, or intercity districts in American northern cities. Oh, Tony keeps ticking away here. Jim Crow uh, is the explicit and implicit in World War I Pen era Pennsylvania. White industrial workers systematically favor uh, black, uh, Eastern European immigrants over black workers. I've mentioned here the 1923 Johnston shooting uh, uh, of a young black man, which leads to four to 500 black steel workers being uh, drummed out of the city under the uh, watchful eye of a uh, pro Ku Klux Klan uh, Johnston mayor. It's probably the most shameful incident in Pennsylvania race history. By 1924, the Ku Klux Klan claimed to have 7,000 members in Western Pennsylvania. Maybe they did, I don't know. Of course, I can also claim to be the smartest man in Britain. Maybe it's true, but I doubt it. I suspect you don't believe it either. Shall we do a show? No, <laughs> not just a, sorry. Uh, okay, we have systematically self-segregated church congregations. This is still the case uh, in South in America even today. Uh, there are little things here. In the 1956 adoption statute, Pennsylvania says parents must state their race to make sure black kids end up with black families, white kids with white families. Uh, even I think that's still on the books, although they've been trying to get rid of it for years. Actually, I think it was repealed, thinking about now, uh, under uh, Ed Rendell. Anyway, 1960, shops like the A&P didn't want to hire black workers. So again, it's, it's casual discrimination. The 1955 Pennsylvania Hat passes the Human Relations Act, which tries to stamp out discrimination in all forms. It's topped up in 1961 with the Fair Housing Act, our primary source for this week, which says you cannot discriminate when you're selling a house, renting a house, providing public housing based on the uh, ethnicity of the renter. Uh, keep in mind there are national United States Civil Rights Acts in 57 to 64. So notice Pennsylvania is again first in the nation uh, and it's ahead in both instances and I'll, I'll hand out this hand out. so we're right at the end here I, I'm going to remind you here about Dolores Tucker I'm not going to go through this slide again we've already covered her but she is a sort of next chapter in uh, making sure that there are more women uh, there are more African Americans particularly African American women appointed under Dolores Tucker than at any previous point in Pennsylvania history so I want to finish by talking about the internalization of uh, the uh, democratic identity by African Americans. Well, Southern Democrats like Lyndon Johnson may have tried to pander to the black vote with equal rights legislation whilst themselves being really racist. That doesn't change the fact that African Americans begin to identify with and take ownership of the Democratic Party. Uh, so for example, I give you some uh, notable figures here. Joseph Coleman, president of Philly's Philadelphia City Council, Wilson Good, first black mayor of Philadelphia, uh, and uh, William Gray here, the chairman of the United States House Budget Committee, which if you know anything about U.S. politics, if you hold the purse strings, it's just about the most in the right, final bit here. People have begun to say that the mass incarceration of African Americans, uh, which when you say it like that, sounds like it's, it's an intentional policy, which it's, it's a kind of de facto policy is a form of new Jim Crow, the criminalization of black youth. 
By the 1970s, Philadelphia is called the young gang capital of America. By the 80s, Philadelphia's homicide rate hits 500 a year. That's the equivalent of the entirety of Britain right now, has about 500 a year. Uh, economic decline and deindustrialization radically increase African American poverty when we see uh, increasing university attendance and an education led economy emerging, and African Americans coming from poor neighborhoods are radically less likely to go to university, although there have been all kinds of attempts to fix that. It's never really been counted. Between 1985 and 2000, one new Philadelphia, Pennsylvania prison is built annually. That's a lot of prisons. 1970, the prison population was 14,000. Uh, in 2000, it's 60,000, although it's fallen a little bit. I checked yesterday, it's now 50,000. Prison budget in Pennsylvania rises from 200 million to a billion by the year 2000. And a lot of this is attributed particularly to Bill Clinton, and this is one of the reasons a lot of the black vote didn't want to vote for Hillary Clinton. They associate her with her husband's policies. He passed the Violent Crime Act in 1994 with the three strikes rule, which says if you have three felony convictions, uh, which might just be stealing, I don't know, stealing a mobile phone, right? If it's enough value, of enough value, you go away for life, and he sets high minimum sentences. Uh, and so that radically drives up lifelong incarceration, particularly for African Americans. But the really uncomfortable numbers here are the ones that you can't get away from, and sociologists constantly are fixated on. African Americans are 13% of the US population. You need to know this when under, if you try and understand Anderson's article that you read to the seminar today. 13% of the population is responsible for 40% of prison inmates. All right. is, is that racism in the system? Yes, no, nobody really knows for sure, but probably not enough to account for that. 52% of homicide convictions are African Americans. 60% of robbery convictions, African Americans. 52% of juvenile crime arrests, African Americans. All of this against 13% of the population. This is one of the reasons it's so hard to stomp out racism, because when your average person gets out of their car, as you know, Anderson, from Anderson's article for today's seminar, and Anderson is a professor of African American history at Yale University, who himself is, is an African American. This is why people are afraid. They get out of the car and they say, there are white people on one side of the street, black people on the other side of the street. 60% of robberies occur uh, at the hands of African Americans, so I'll go to the other side of the street. That's racist. But it's hard to convince people not to do that. It also seems like common sense. There's real social problems here. I don't have any answers. Black on black crime is actually far more common uh, than black on white crime, keep in mind. So African Americans are victims here as well. Problems. Last slide, I know I've run over a little bit here. Uh, Clinton uh, pa also passes 1996 Welfare Act after the Violent Crime Act. It increases uh, food stamps and government free money, particularly for African Americans. But the problem is this creates uh, a cycle of dependency where generations of people are, are generationally unemployed, living on these more and more generous public benefits, but not actually improving their lives. Uh, Obama's election in 2008 was hailed as the beginning of a post-racial America. But all he did was double down on these policies, and it's done nothing to improve the lives of ordinary African Americans in terms of crime rates and in bettering their position in society generationally. There's a rejection of Hillary Clinton as too white and too rich by a significant part of the African American electorate who went out and voted for Obama. Because the Democratic Party has doubled down for the last 15 years on identity politics, saying, you know, Republicans are too white, they shouldn't represent you. That works fine when Obama's a president, but when you try and get a, a wrinkly old white woman from a, a wealthy family elected, people say, actually, you're right, she doesn't represent us. There's a great quote here by Jack Brewer, CEO of the Brewer Group. Uh, I can't read it all out here, but it's his take on, on why African Americans, while they don't want to vote Republican, they also are reluctant to vote Democrat. So we get to the hardest of real social problems here. At any rate, uh, read this long quote in your own time and well, head upstairs.